Well, I bless you. I thank you for being here this morning. I'm super excited about this message. I'm going to be speaking on um, the courts of heaven. And the first thing I'm going to do, I, I couldn't find the hammer and I don't have a gavel, so I'm using my wrench. I'm, hear ye, hear ye. Come to attention. For the court of this court is in session. The honorable judge of this court presiding. Bring your petition before the courts and you shall be heard. Now when we hear that, right, and I don't know about you, but I like law and order and my judge shows and I love watching all those kinds of law shows. But when we hear that and we hear the bailiff speak those words, something happens within us, right? Um, we're either told to stand or come to order and we do. There is a parallel in the spirit realm. There's a parallel in heaven of things coming to order within the courts of heaven. And this teaching this morning is to share with you, to show you and help you, equip you to go into those courts and to receive your settlement, to receive what belongs to you. We engage, we listen, we have a response. We bring our focus and our attention to the judge. Let me show you what doesn't happen. Give me my cell phone. It's in my, or I'll take your cell phone. That's fine. Um, Dozer. Dozer, can you be judge? You be judge. And Nova, come up. And Valor, come up. Right here, stand here. And Dandelion, come up. Okay, so we have the judge. Hey, judge. Yes. His shoulder was healed too. Okay, we have the judge. We have, come here. We have our petitioner. Okay, so every court has these roles. Petitioner, we have the witness, the witness, and we have the advocate or the lawyer. Okay, so we've got the lawyer, the ad, I love you, but in this, for this, you're the lawyer. Okay, lawyer, the advocate, petitioner, witness, and judge. Right? That's on the earth. But in the heavens, we have you as the petitioner, Jesus as the advocate, Holy Spirit as the witness, witness, lawyer, Jesus, judge is the father. So father, <laughs> the father judge, Holy Spirit witness, petitioner, which is you and I, and Jesus as the advocate, okay? Now, this is what you don't see with Judge Judy or when a judge is speaking. You have your phone and the judge is speaking over the petitioner and you don't have the petitioner uh, looking on YouTube for funny cat videos, right? What would happen in a court if while the judge is speaking, you're distracted on your social media? That doesn't happen. You put that phone down or any other distraction because the authority and dominion is coming towards you. Things are being spoken that are being created a new reality in your life and we don't want to miss it, all right? Now that's not a hint to turn off your phones now, but you know, might want to have them on mute. Thanks everyone, you can sit down. You don't want to be held in. Are you reading my notes? Did you peek ahead of my? You gotta watch this young man, I tell you. That's good. Um, Every, all the references this morning is from a wonderful teaching on the courts of heaven from Elizabeth Nixon, um, out, outstanding. She's got two um, separate books, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. So the purpose of this teaching, how to go into the courts. How do we do it? How to take title. How to take title of your promises. Now, I don't know about you, but that excites me to think, how can I take title of my promises and how to re receive a judgment in your favor. Yes. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to take a moment to think of the promises that are not your reality yet. I want you to think for a moment and let that settle. For some of us, it'll come real quick. Others might have to search a little. What promises are not your reality yet? Is there a health promise? that you're not walking in? Is there uh, a peace or, or family unity 
that you're not walking in yet? That's not your reality? Is there a, maybe a personal prophetic word that you haven't stepped into? A word from the Lord that just hasn't been made manifest in your life and you're wondering, what's up with that? Why, why aren't I getting traction? Let me tell you, in addition, what this teaching is not. This teaching is not name it and claim it. Okay, for some of us that have been around a little while, a little while, uh, name it and claim it got real popular in the 70s, 80s, a little bit in the 90s. This is not name it and claim it. This is not protocol and procedures. I'm not going to give you a checklist. I have to do this, this, this. No. And interestingly enough, though this is about the courts, this is not about legalism. This is not about legalism. It would seem that way, but it isn't. This teaching and my hope and desire when you leave here today will be part of creating a foundation of new intimacy with God. Everything that we do, everything that you do on a daily basis is meant to foster the intimacy with God, the flowing in the spirit, understanding and maturity. So I've introduced the players. So here's a key scripture. And there are no less, and I looked it up in the Greek, there are no less than 19 times justice and foundation are used to describe the Lord. So Psalm 97.2, oh, oh, thanks. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. And I, I want you to consider, and again, Psalm 89, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. That's how important it is to the Lord that you receive justice, that you walk and live in your justice and in right standing. So why are the courts necessary? Why, why are they necessary? Question, have you believed, and is there a Bible here, just, or a book? I'll just pretend, can I use your phone again? I'm sorry, can I use it again? We're just gonna pretend that this is an actual Bible book. But most of us, you know, I used to have a heavy Bible, but now I have access to so many translations through the the different apps, that's been a really neat thing. So we're going to pretend this is a Bible. Have you believed, have you believed, if there is a promise in the word of God that it just is, and I should just step into it? If, if it's there, I should just step into it. I shouldn't have to do anything for a promise. If I've accepted Christ and he says everything is mine, then okay, the Bible says it is, it is. And if we have every spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1, 3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ, then why don't we experience this? Why aren't we experiencing the promises? If God says this and he promises it, then why isn't it a reality? Why, not, why, aren't, why aren't I living it? The truth is, and I just want you to consider this. What if God is waiting for you to ask so that he can give us what we are asking for? No different than the judge. Just because you go into the courts with the judge, you can't just stand there and say nothing and say, rule in my favor. You have to present your case. You have to speak. How can he rule if you're not making a request? How can the judge or the father, the Lord, rule in your favor if you're not presenting what it is that you would have him rule for. This teaching is to help us become more effective and to have more authority in our prayer life, yes, in our prayer life petitions, and to see godly justice prevail in our lives. Who says, I'll take a double dose of godly justice in my life? The enemy has robbed me. I have been lied to. There have been so many things in my life that have not bore out like I know they were supposed to bear out. And I'm choosing now in this teaching to share with you how to shift things back into 
alignment with how God thing, has set things up. John 16, 23 through 24, in that day, when we are with him face to face, you will ask of me nothing, because you will be with the Father, and your joy will be full. But for now, ask of me whatever you will, so that your Father who is in heaven may give it to you, so that your joy may be full. First John 5, 14 says it this way, this is the confidence that we have in God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we have desired. We love those scriptures, but let's get them in context. We don't cherry pick scriptures and we use scripture to back up scripture, to confirm scripture. We always go both sides. So what are the courts of heaven? There are prayers that we have prayed that have gone unanswered. Anyone have an unanswered prayer today? Oh, we have one person? Wow, you guys are amazing. Well, then let's eat lunch. If you don't have any unanswered prayers, you're, you're all good. It may not be that what we are asking for is wrong, but that there is a different venue, a different way in which to pray. We understand warfare type prayers, right? Where we go in and we battle or deliverance prayers. Um, chances are you've prayed in the courts of heaven. You just didn't recognize that you were. And I just want to identify it so you can understand it. This is the power of the courts of heaven. When you come to understand where and how you are actually praying, you can use this understanding to position and position to your advantage. And this is the point of this teaching, to show you the resource and position you have in the courts of heaven. So this is what I want you to do right now. As I am speaking over you, as you are getting expanded in your capacity and understanding about the courts of heaven, I want you to picture in your mind and allow Holy Spirit to give that to you, the judge being before you, Jesus as your advocate, Holy Spirit within and surrounding you. Because we take our position no differently than when you go to court, hopefully as an honor of respect to the court, we dress a certain way. We prepare ourselves a certain way before we go in. Similarly, similarly, now don't get me wrong, go in and, and, and pray and we want to be connected at all times, no question. But there are also some times where there's a shift that's taken place where we need to clothe ourselves, where we need to be prepared, where we need to be positioned before entering in as well as a sign of respect and honor and just preparation to receive. Praying the word of the Lord back to him, calling forth his promises are part of the courts of heaven. Interestingly enough, although you're going to be hearing more about the courts, it's kind of a, a, a recent word that's going around uh, right now. It's not a new teaching. In fact, the Old Testament and the New Testament prophets and apostles all wrote from the perspective of the courts. They wrote from that perspective. They talk about judicial thrones of God, magistrate, the kingly throne, repeatedly, repeatedly, Old and New Testament. So, how to step into your inheritance. Our inheritance is our destiny to pursue the Lord. That's your inheritance. Your destiny is pursuing the Lord with passion through the foundation of your identity. And your identity, and I know especially for the young people here today, their identity is so impacted by their peers, by social media. For those of us older, we didn't have to deal with Tweety, 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 Twitter. <sighs> yeah, you could tell I'm not part of the younger crowd even with that. Twitter and, and likes and check marks and whatever. I mean, they are so impacted. I mean, for us, you know, we went to high school and then we came home and that was it. But they, it's, it, it's never ending. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 300, they're inundated by all kinds of, and the impressionable minds are so impacted and affected by what people are saying or not saying. 
it's no small thing that their identity is so impacted. Thank, thank you, God, that we can go back to our firm foundation of who God says, who God says you are. What is God saying of you? The court affords us the venue, the venue where we can flow from his Holy Spirit following his leading. Um, and it always comes down to renewing our minds, reminding ourselves of what God says, what his love is, deepening our relationship with Jesus. Um, this teaching is to make it easier to understand the courts, your role, and how to operate within them. So let's start, I know this is a foundation, um, but let's start at square one, which is prayer. Now I know we all pray, and that's wonderful, and, and, and the Father loves, loves that. I want to just press in a little bit more into that subject. The best place to start for the courts, for your relationship, right? For a husband and wife, for a husband and wife, the number one thing that's a make or a break in a marriage is what? Communication, right? Communication. All right, if one person's talking all the time, okay, then it's not communication, it's a monologue. And the other one is not being able to connect. Um, it's just as valuable and important that we have a conversation with God where we speak and we are quiet and we listen to him. And for some, that's a new, that's a different concept. That's, that's, that's an expansion of thinking. Because for some of us, we've been taught, you know, get those prayers out, speak and get it, speak, 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 speak. But I'm encouraging you today to take that time to stop, to stop. So what is prayer? How do we pray? How does prayer work? And in terms of venue for where we pray and how we pray, what role do the courts play? Mark 6, 46, when he had dismissed and released them, those are the people, Jesus departed to the mountain to pray. This word in the Greek is prosuchomai. Prosuchomai. We're going to say that together. Prosuchomai. Again, prosuchomai is the word in the Greek. And I want you to hear, because it, it may be more than you realize prayer. In the Greek, it means entering into God's presence. Entering into God's presence. And the emphasis is not on the words that you're saying. It, that's so interesting. When you go to this original Greek word, it's not about the words. It's about the coming into, the actually entering into. Because don't you find, I know I do, that I talk to my friends and, and, and that's wonderful, but something happens in me when I position myself before speaking to God. There's just, there's a shift that happens in me. It's a, it's a totally different arena in my life. Prosuchomai, the important thing is to come into God's presence. Wherever you are, the coming in. Only secondary, first is the coming, secondary is the, con the content or the requests, the what we say. So first is the coming, second is the speaking or uh, connecting through requests. That means when you pray, and I, there's people that need to hear this right now, so I, I need your focus. When you pray, you don't have to get the words right. Some of us have been taught over the years there are certain words to say in certain ways, certain checklists. That's not what prosuchamai means. It means to enter in and yes, to speak, but in a way that comes from your heart and not from it having to be a certain way of speaking at all. No different than if I go to speak to my husband, all right, I don't think, okay, first I need to say it like this, and then I need to say it like that, and then I got to make sure I wrap it up with the greeting, and the, I just, we just connect. The father is looking for a bride. The groom, Jesus, 
is looking for a bride that has such intimacy, and those of you will understand this, whether it's a best friend, someone you've known a long time, husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, you know when you have an inside joke or something and you can just look at each other and you know what the other person is thinking. Like you can smile or laugh because you just, you know what the other person is thinking. That, that is what the Lord is looking for in his bride. That you can look and it connects, you're, you're connected. That it gets to the point where it's almost like the Lord doesn't even have to speak something to you. You just, you sense it and you know that's that level of intimacy. And the courts of heaven foster that. And it comes through uh, prayer. You don't have to get the words right. The important part is not what you say. The important part is simply that you come. There's a deeper meaning. There's a deeper meaning as well. Not only the coming, but in the coming, we interact with God. Exchanging, and this is where it gets a little challenging, exchanging our human ideas, our wishes, our dreams, the stuff that we want for his ideas, his wishes, his desires, a divine exchange, divine exchange. He imparts faith to us. That's where that place of intimacy, where it's just looking at one another, it's that place that flows out of us where James 5.16 speaks about the difficult, stupendous, incredible things. The prayer of those in right standing with God has great power and produces wonderful result. So, examples <clears throat> of requirements for fulfilling promises. What are some examples of this? Romans 10, 9 through 10. This is kind of a, an umbrella scripture that kind of reveals the, the pattern, the pattern that we want to foster. If you declare with your mouth, that's your action, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that's your action, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So, my Bible has this scripture, Romans 10, 9 and 10, correct? My Bible has this scripture, and I want a family member, or I want someone that I care about, or even a stranger, anyone, to be saved, and I hand them the Bible, and I tell them, salvation is in there, and they go, great. And they put it in their pocket and they go on their way. Because this scripture's in there, right? So they've got it. They own it. It's theirs. No. In the same way that salvation is laid out before us in total clarity. How does this happen? Believing, speaking, declaring, all of the parts of Romans 10, 9, and 10, it is the same pattern that is created in the courts of heaven for the promises of God. To say I have the promises, okay, put it in my pocket, walk along. Do you, do you have them? But are they active in your life? No. Are, there being, are they in, in under administration in your life? No. We do have our part to play, just like we did with our salvation. We needed to believe, right? We needed to declare for our salvation. Kind of like if you own a TV. If you own a TV, if you don't turn the TV on and you don't know what channel to turn on to find your show, you can say, well, the show's on right now. But if you don't dial it in, you don't plug it in, you don't click it in, you don't get it. And I want each and every one of you to be so full of the promises of God and experiencing that, that it just gets fun. We're, we are meant to have fun too, right, in our lives, to enjoy our salvation, to enjoy the fact that we have opportunity to not only experience God, but to enjoy our lives. And I want that for you as well. Okay, so how do you take title? 
how do you take title when you when you when you buy a house okay exchange money right that house is not recognized as mine until it's registered in the city in the courts there has to be a legal deed with my name on it that says I own this house right it needs to be part of the public records um, if you don't if that doesn't happen you can say it's my house all day long but there's there's nothing that's established that um, legally this um, what it does when you when you register let's say the deed of the house the courts now recognize that it's your house the judge understands that it's yours but now the public records say it as well what it does is tell everybody else in the world that they now how they have to deal with you as the legal owner listen to me this now says when there has been a legal decree okay when there has been le legal paperwork created signed off by the judge by the father by the Lord on your behalf the judge already knows right and you know you knew the house was yours the judge knew the house was yours but now everybody else knows and they have to deal with you as the owner that means in the spirit realm for you that when you claim your promise when you go into that court when you know who you are before the throne and the father has ruled the judge has ruled in your favor saved judge knows you know but now the enemy knows now the enemy has to deal with you differently he doesn't deal with you like he deals with everybody else that is a thrilling concept if we can get a hold of that because the enemy will go as far as you let him he'll go as far as you let him he'll just keep he's a bully he'll just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming until you say no more that's enough just like with the house right the utility company the insurance company the cable they now recognize me as owner they got to deal with me they have to deal with me we must go into the heavenly courts and take title to the promises that we don't actually have yet I own the Bible but I don't have the promises the health promise unity and family kingdom position financial strategy when we take the promise from the Word of God into the courts so that means first what we have to do we have to know what the promises are and I don't know about you but I am such a fan of Google I love me some Google because before I had to get out the big concordance and look everything <laughs> it was so much work and now I could just Google something and it just pops right up makes it super easy it's it's almost too easy you know sometimes I think things are maybe a little too easy for us um, but to take the promises you could just Google promises of God and it just lists them we confess with our mouths just like with salvation we believe in our hearts and what it does no differently than now I'm owner of the property it changes your identity this actually changes your identity by the renewing of your mind because all of a sudden when you have those promises and you start believing those promises are actually for me then you now have a whole new resource in order to release on the earth or any place the enemy is trying to come against you the accuser you know now you have a whole weapon system to use and we would be missing out if we didn't avail ourselves of the very tool chest um, or weaponry to use against the enemy this changes our identity not only before the judge of heaven our God but now the judge requires the rest of the spirit realm to deal with us in this new capacity I love that how assured so question how assured I mean assured are you right this moment of your identity in Christ how assured are you and we're not going to hold hands or no one's coming forward we're not going to break into teams and talk about it I'm just asking you just to do an inner check just transparent before God and within yourself yeah how sure am I what do I truly think are you convinced of God's grace 
in your life? Are you daily aware of your connection to him? Are you progressing? Are you progressing in your purpose? His plans for your life. Now, I did an experiment this past 10 days with certain people that I thought it would be fun because I don't, I never preach or teach anything that I don't do myself. But what we did was, um, Elizabeth Nixon, who this teaching is um, based upon, she's got these decrees. And they're kind of lengthy, actually. They're kind of long. But she has these decrees. And I prayed, and the Father said, give me a week to prove it to you. <clears throat> give me a week to prove of my decrees. And I, okay. So I shared this with some of my people, and I said, will you join me in making these decrees over the next seven to ten days, and let's see if anything changed in our lives, whether it changed our identity, if we saw the manifestation of financial miracles or health restoration. I mean, just in every, every layer, every level. And so I'm not going to ask you guys to come up. I'm just going to ask by a show of hands. Who would say, for those that have done the decrees with me this past 10 days, that you actually saw a change, a difference, like absolutely the decrees worked in your life? Can you raise your hands for those that... Okay, well, that's everybody that I asked, actually. I'm raising my hands, too. Um, everybody that I asked actually saw literal physical changes in their lives. Okay, so I'm not up here um, trying to sound like I know what I'm talking about because I couldn't fool anybody with that, but um, I am up here saying that I, we've done this and we've actually seen going into the courts in this way bringing God's word before him, believing that it was going to change, believing that it was going to get traction in our lives, and it actually did. Now, to me, that's a thrilling concept. That's, that's thrilling that that is actually a literal um, invitation and opportunity to experience that. And I have those decrees. And if you want those decrees, please connect with me afterwards. I will get your email. I'll send them to you today, and you can have them. All right, I love, I, I want to see this for you. So we're, we're wrapping up here. Unanswered prayers. Recall I posed this question 15 minutes ago. To take a moment and think about the promises that are not yet a reality in your life. I think we all have that. I have that. Certain promises that I just, I'm not seeing. The health promise, the peace, family, unity, the prophetic word. How do you get, how do you, how do you literally, practically get the promises from here to here? From here to here. How, how does that happen? This is how. I'm only talking about two courts. There are many courts. Two courts. These, there's the court of redemption and the court of inheritance. To come in to step into the promises of God. If you want to step into the promises of God, you've got to step through the blood. To step into the promise, you've got to step through the blood of Jesus. Redemption, redemption, the court of redemption, the blood court, and in the natural, that would be like the criminal court. There's the civil court, which would be the court of inheritance, and let's say the criminal court, which would be the blood court. I'll speak of that in a moment. Redemption enables us to be cleansed, that we are now positioned for inheritance. You know what we do? This is what we do. We battle all day long, and we get struck down over and over to where we feel about this big. And then we try to go into the courts of inheritance and say, I get everything, and we feel we feel this small. And so we can't, we don't see ours. We're grasshoppers. We feel like we're grasshoppers. Well, we come into the court of inheritance. Instead of going through the blood court and being absolutely renewed and, and brought back to that place of salvation and what that means, what the blood of Jesus means, Revelation 12.10 says, the accuser of the brethren, our adversary, accuses 
the brethren before God day and night. He's never going to stop. If you're waiting for the enemy to stop, he's not, he's not going to stop. Yes, possible reasons why our prayers aren't answered. Like I said, we kind of we kind of leapfrog over the blood of Jesus and try and get on our own, get what we're trying to get from God. Like God is withholding it. Like it's a tug of war. Like somehow we don't, uh, we don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. We haven't worked hard enough. We haven't prayed hard enough. We haven't read enough the Bible, all the, all the law minded things. So we feel it, it's almost like the enemy causes us to feel like God is our adversary. Like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get it from him. Or what do I got to do to get it? Because we bypass the court of redemption, which says, I have cleansed you so completely. And I have some references here I think that will really help you. Um, but first, so a couple possible reasons why our prayers aren't answered. The enemy has a legal right a legal right to prevent answers to prayer if either personal or bloodline sin is still an issue. If that's still an issue, that's going to block. That's going to significantly block you from receiving. And also, like I referenced before, praying prayers according to your own will. What I want, what I want, what I want. And then when you don't get it, you get bitter and angry at God that he didn't give it to you. Okay, that can definitely cause us not to experience the fullness of our relationship and intimacy with God. The court of redemption is our first stop. The purpose of the blood of Jesus. Now, if you haven't listened to anything else, please listen to this because this is the game changer in your life right now. Give me five minutes of your attention and just listen to what I have to say. The purpose of the blood of Jesus is that it serves to prevent the record of sin even from coming into court. Hear that. It is so important. Do you know who's bringing your sin into court? You. You are. You continue to bring your sin into the court of inheritance or into the court because number one, so many of us have been so beaten down. It's been, we've been taught by good people you, everyone has been so well-meaning, but they've been a little misguided because we've, we've been taught a certain way that took grace out of the equation. So now we're chasing after a moving target, trying to find God's love, God's redeeming power, who I am. It's just, it's gotten so muddied and muddled and it's been so difficult. I'm telling you now, hear me again. The purpose of the blood of Jesus is that it serves to prevent the record of sin even from coming into court, which the enemy's strategy, we see this all the time, right? In crime dramas, the prosecutor's trying to get the evidence in, right? The enemy is bombarding you, trying to get you to agree with your sin record. He's trying to get you to agree over and over. I'm such a sinner. I've fallen again. I have a lust issue. I've had difficulty handling my money. I, I've had a challenge with forgiving this one. I've, I, it's been one crisis after another. It, right? The pummeling, the pummeling. And if he can get you so in that, thinking that over and over and over again, we completely miss the truth. And the truth is this. The blood of Jesus prevents the evidence of sin from coming against us. And Ephesians 1, 11 through 14, and don't have time. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14 says, the word says it seals up the matter. It's sealed. Now in the natural courts, okay, in the natural courts, the judge can say, pretend this is a gavel. This is a gavel in the prophetic. See it in the spirit. It's a gavel. Um, the judge can say, I will not hear that information. I, I will not, I will dismiss that. I won't even hear it. And what does the, what do the attorneys try to do? I want to get it on the record, right? That's what the attorney will say. I want to get it on the record. Why? So it can be used against you later in another court case. That's what the enemy does. I'm trying to get your sin on the record. 
our judge, our righteous judge says, it's expunged. And expunged means it's like it never happened. It doesn't even exist. It no longer exists. It's not even that it's been written down and sealed because like in the juvenile court, if you've done something wrong and you're under 16 or under 18, they'll seal it. They'll seal it. So no one can get con no one can see it. No one can read it until a certain age and then they expunge it like it never existed. All right? But in our court, in the heavenly court, the blood of Jesus says doesn't exist anymore. It's like it was never written down. I can't even see it. Why? Now we know that God knows everything, right? He knows our every thought, our every sin, our every action. He knows everything. But in his mercy, in his perfection, he chooses not to see. He chooses not to see. He could choose to look at your sin all day long and be in judgment over you. That's his right as God. But he says, I don't see that because I only see the blood of my son. I don't even see it. It doesn't even exist. If we could get a, if you could get a hold of that today, this is the only thing you hear from me. It's a, it's a life defining moment because when the enemy says, Hey, read the record, you can now say to him, it doesn't exist. It's not even there. It's completely covered by the blood of Jesus. It is so thrilling uh, to me. This is a legal precedent still in effect today. What started with Moses, remember it was Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, when all the people were coming forward and Moses was judging him and he was so exhausted, it was Jethro who said, hey, let's break this into different uh, sizes of people. And they cr it created literally the court system that's still happening 2,000 years later. It's still the basis of the court system we have today and the legal precedences that we use today. That's how amazing the word of God is. And when God sets a matter, he sets a matter. If the judge determines that a certain matter is sealed in the court records, it's not available for public access. The public can't get access to it. The blood operates the same way, seals the matter so that the accuser, listen, the accuser and the enemy no longer has access to the information. Listen to me. The enemy no longer has access to the in your sin record. He doesn't have access. What happens is, you know, the enemy can't read your mind, right? Enemy can't read your mind. He may try and convince you that he's reading your mind, but he can't. What he can do is bait the hook of a thought and cast it into your mind. He can throw things into your mind, but he can't read your mind, the thoughts that you have. He can't do that, okay? What he wants to do is bait the hook. Remember, he's watched you your whole life. He knows the right bait for each and every one of us, right? It's very tempting to throw that in so that you'll start agreeing with the old you that committed that sin record. He wants you to get into old... Um, Egypt identity. He wants you to think old ways, be old ways. And it's hard, right? Because our flesh is really used to those old ways. There are old ways because we liked them, right? Amen? We liked them. That's why we did them. And for many of us, we did them a lot. And so because of that, it, it created patterns, created ways of thinking and being. And now we have that little bit of a battle on our hands. It's, under, it's, it's all right. The blood covers, the blood covers, seals the matter, and even the best of all, the blood operates the same way, seals the matter, so the accuser and the enemy no longer have access to that information. It is now a private matter between the judge and the petitioner. It's private. No one else has access no one else can read it at all. The enemy wants you to start speaking it and believing it again, but then that's where we draw that line and say no. In addition, the blood creates a pardon, a pardon. We are pardoned from the sin. 
You've been pardoned. If you've never heard that before, you were set for the death penalty. We all were. And you've been pardoned back into life. In addition, the final is remission. Remission, this is the final. The legal definition of remission not only means that we're forgiven, but the sin now is struck from the record. Forgiven, gone. There is nothing even sealed because we are being treated as if we never sinned in the first place, as if it never happened. If you can get a hold of that, you are nine steps of 10 into absolute deliverance and healing in every way, if you can get that. So I want you to, and, and in addition, you know, my notes are always available. If anyone wants my notes, I, I would be glad to give you all my notes. But by knowing that I am so forgiven and it's so gone and I don't have to, I don't have to engage in that level again. So we've taken our stand before the righteous judge, claimed the blood of Jesus. So we've gone through the blood, the court of redemption. We've confessed with our mouths. We've believed in our hearts, Romans 10, 9 and 10. But now what? Now what do we do? Give me five minutes, we'll be done. The court of inheritance. The spirit realm, the spirit realm, okay? Now, if you don't know this, I'll just let you know. The spirit realm is very active, highly active, always moving. The angelic realm, the demonic realm, the unseen, what we can't see, it's happening all the time, all around us. But when we've gone through the blood, okay, we've been marked, we've been sealed. That's what anointed means, to be smeared. We've been smeared now. We've been smeared by the blood, which says, Jesus says, that one's mine, that one's mine, that one's mine, because we've now been touched, smeared. The spirit realm now sees us as sin-free. Nothing blocks us from stepping into the promises now. Nothing blocks you. Nothing is to block you. Question, what are you contending for? What are you have you been contending or have you just been worn out? Maybe you're contending for contending. Have you been contending or it's just like, well, nothing ever happens. I pray and just sometimes things get worse. And boy, I, I can, I relate and can understand that. Consider what you're contending for. Let that come into your heart now. The court of inheritance is not a criminal court. Like the court of redemption, it's a civil court. And that, do you know, here's the glory news. The court of inheritance, okay, is not a criminal court. That means no prosecution. There's no prosecution in the court of inheritance. That is such wonderful news. The enemy can't go into the court of inheritance, the criminal court but not the court, he's not even there. That is, well, I was excited when I learned that. I thought it was good news. <laughs> I liked it. There's no enemy in the courts of heaven. You all are doing so well. We're almost done. How to operate, how to operate. Galatians 4, one through two. If a father dies, leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not, not much better off than the slaves because until they grow up, even though they actually own everything. They own everything their father had. They have to obey the guardian or the trustee until they reach the age of maturity that the father has set. What that means is, is you've inherited, you've inherited, but you're too young, you're too little. So a trustee is put in charge and then as you mature, as you get older, you get more and more resources until you're ready to release your guardian, release your trustee, saying, I don't need that anymore. I'm ready now to move on with the fullness of my inheritance. So my question to you this morning is, are you ready to release the guardian, to release your trustee? Are you ready to say to God this morning, I'm ready in fullness of maturity? I am mature. 
I am ready to be a good steward with resources. I am ready to step into a place where I am diligent with your promises. I am ready to be your ambassador and go where you would have me go and say what you would have me say. Each one of these are a challenge that God is giving us this morning, but our part is to recognize where are you in your age of maturity? Where are you in your age of maturity? Are you, are you willing to say, hmm, I don't know where I am. I'm not sure. But if the word is clear in Galatians that we have inherited all the Father has given us, then why aren't we seeing it? If, if we have it, why aren't we seeing it? One reason is that until we reach the age of maturity, the Father has said, we are the same as slaves. Until we reach that, we're the same as slaves. We have ownership of it all but no administration, no distribution, no management rights. Just like when you see, we've all seen this, where someone who's really, really wealthy lets their, their teenager inherit and they blow it all. It's just, it's gone. You know, a million dollars and they just blow it because they're not mature to handle the resource, what it is. We want to be taught how to act. And that's the law's purpose, to teach us, to have that full access. But in addition, the trustee or guardian on earth, the pre premise is um, that you're getting your basic needs met. The trustee gives you your basic needs. And we want to step into the abundance of God, not just our basic needs. So are you ready now? This is now, you're going to respond. Are you ready to step out from under the law? Yes. <gasps> okay. I love that. Are you ready? Uh -uh. Are you ready to step out from under the law? Yes. Okay. If the law is your trustee and you are ready to step out from under it in legal terms, you ask for the trustee to be removed. And I bet a lot of us have not done that. You ask for the trustee to be removed. The word says the only requirement to have this trustee removed is to attain maturity. Can't ask for the trustee to be removed until you attain maturity. And the word and the enemy would describe to us, listen, the word and the enemy would describe to us, maturity is how we act or what we do. Well, you and I both know, right? Let's be honest. We're family. If it all comes down to how well I uphold things, it's, uh, we might as well just go home. Because I, there's just, I do not have what it takes to sustain that kind of, I don't, right? I get really good for a while. I'm going really well, I get traction on my life, I'm making right choices, and then, you know, I, I know not, none of you have that issue, but I do. The word in the enemy would describe to us maturity as how we act and what we do to get it right. I'm going to do it, I'm going to work, I'm going to try, which is what legalism is. Living outside sin, we all desire to live outside sin, but we're all dealing with sin in one measure or another in our lives. Not one amen to that one. Now see, I'm on to y'all. I'm seeing this. But Galatians 5.8 says, if you are led by the Spirit, then you are not under the law. If you are led by the Spirit, that's it. If you know that, if you know I'm not led I'm led by the Spirit. So the greater your intimacy with God, the closer you come to Him, the connection eye to eye, the quickening of His presence, all of this is all being led by the Spirit. And if you're being led by the Spirit, the good news is you're not under the law. And the enemy wants to shove us under the law. And we can say, I won't go. Because the law is not the dictate. The law has been fulfilled by Jesus. 
I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to. If I tried, I would fail every time. That's why the enemy, the Lord gave us the law, right? So we'd get to the end of ourselves and realize I can't fulfill it. Well, let's just jump to the end of the story and say, can't fill it. Okay, I'm done. I know I can't do it. Because then that lets us step into being filled and led by the Spirit. And if you believe that, if you believe that, and if you've never had a filling of the Holy Spirit, let's do that today. You've never experienced that? Boy, God is so generous with his presence and his spirit. If you haven't had that, let's pray for that today. But the truth is when you're filled by the Spirit of God, the law takes its place where it's supposed to go. And that is not in the forefront of you trying to fulfill it in your life because you're no longer under it. Call to grace. The court of inheritance is a call to live at the foot of the throne of grace. That's what it is. To be at his feet is to be in the court of inheritance. To be at his feet is to be at the court of inheritance. Is there any better place than to be Mary sitting at his feet and just enjoying who he is and, and just enjoying his smiling on you? and just enjoying the fact that he wants you, he's named you, he's called you, he, he wants to spend time with you. Is there any better place to be than at his feet, just in that sweet, tender place? Is there a greater inheritance than taking that spot? Oh, that's so good. Okay, all right, so this is what we're gonna do now. I'm gonna have you respond. We're ready to release ourselves from the trustee of the law. We're ready to step into our maturity. We're ready to yield. So this is what we're going to do. If we could have music, maybe, if that's all right. Okay. If this morning something that was said over you, something the Holy Spirit quickened to you, and you realize, I think I need to step through the court of redemption again. I have not allowed the blood of Jesus to define who I am and all that he intends for me. I've, it just, it's time for me now to kind of renew that space, whether if you have not made a commitment to Christ or maybe you just need that establishing again, you're going to come over here. I need my team to come up. You're going to come here, okay? If this is totally established in your life, and just so you know, just so I'm clear, if I was sitting in your seat, I would start here. Even though I'm teaching this, because I want to renew my mind over and over, because I need it. Okay, so I would start here. If, on the other hand, like you, you're really confident and assured that you've this the court of uh, redemption, you you feel right, then this I need half of you to come over here is the court of inheritance the court of inheritance which these people will pray over you lay hands over you to help position you at his feet perhaps remove some of the things that have kept you from the realization of who you are and to receive and that's going to be uh, declaring that they are mature okay and that now the trustee can be removed. Okay, those are the two big ones. All right. And I need the offering baskets, please. And if you, this morning, you feel really good about this, and you feel really good about this, right here, thank you. And you just want prayer. You want someone to lay hands on you. You want prayer for your family. Whatever that is, you're going to come in the middle. Okay? So I need you come over here. We'll be here. I just grab hold of him and he's. I almost didn't. You see that? I almost didn't have to say anything. I almost just looked at him and he knew to come. See, that's kind of the. <laughs> um, you're going to come here. I uh, praying about this. Um, offerings. All right. Your first act in coming forward is to bring your offering. Let that be part of your worship this morning. I know it's usually walking through um, the baskets, but this time bring your tithes, your offerings to the storehouse. Bring them up, and you're going to put them there. Does anyone have any questions before we start? I'm going to pray. I want, as I pray, 
for those that want the prayer. Uh, I'm going to pray like a prayer of dismissal for those who don't want to come forward, which is totally fine. Um, but for those that do, we're going to finish this ministry. Am I forgetting, Gary, am I forgetting any announcements or anything else we need to do? Okay. Um, can we turn the music up, please, just a bit? Father, thank you for this morning. Lots of material. This was more like a, a whole series of, of messages, but I thank you for transcending my own limitations and giving your sons and daughters what they needed to hear exactly the way they needed to hear it, that they could receive it and have transformation. And now, Lord, you've kind of set the table for us, set the stage for us to respond to you. We don't want to miss out on what you have released on this Yom Kippur day. We don't want to um, walk by or not have the time or attention towards you because we want everything, everything that you've created specifically for this body today. And we thank you, Lord, for the invitation. Now guide us. You say for us to be led by your spirit, and we really want to be in tune, Lord, to be quiet and sensitive to your still, small voice. Lord, help us not to miss it. We don't want to be deceived. We don't want to be full of ourselves or our own opinion. We want it to be completely dictated, led by, enforced, infused, energized, and fulfilled by you and you alone. And for those that desire to come forward, that they will receive mightily. I just call forth the glory of the Lord in this place, that such healing on all levels, your sons and daughters crave your mighty touch in their lives. And they have, so many are battle weary. So many have just tried to make it another day. They have fought hard Lord, because they desire to honor you. They, they desire to serve you. They desire to please you. And to whatever extent or level this teaching on the courts in heaven helps fulfill that mandate in their lives of who they are, what they were designed and created for. We thank you, God, that the seeds that have been released from heaven reach the fertile soil within us. And however we're to shepherd them, however we're to nurture them, whatever we to do, God, we honestly and sincerely want to. Please help us fulfill our part. And we thank you, God, now for the tithes and offerings. We release that from the earth curse system into the heavens. We thank you for touching and blessing this body, this church, these grounds, Lord, dedicated solely to you and your purpose. We, Father, we corporately thank you for the ministry of Chuck and Lexi and the worship team, all those that um, work so hard, especially behind the scenes, to create atmosphere that we can just step into. We thank you for that, Lord. And Father, I just pray now in, in a prayer of release and dismissal, thank you for blessing your children today. Thank you for bringing them in and allowing them to hear just what they needed. And as they move forward into today and the coming week, I just pray Psalm 91 protection upon each and every one of them, that they are above and not beneath, that doors of opportunity open, that they are fully protected, God, that they will see you every day. We thank you for blessing our time together this morning. And I release them now. In the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, we pray. Amen. Amen. 